Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to welcome you to our webinar for customer engagement trends that will impact your business. My name is Jen Betts. I'm a Senior Product Marketing Manager here at Log Me In, and I'll be your monitor, moderator today. Before we get started, I'd just like to go over one quick housekeeping item. We want this session to be interactive, so we've set aside some time for Q&A towards the end of the webinar. Please feel free to submit questions at any time throughout the discussion. You can find the Q&A entry field by clicking on the red Q&A button in the menu near the bottom of your screen. And without further ado, let me introduce today's speaker. I am joined by Kate Leggett, Vice President and Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kate to get us started. Hi, Jen. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks to all of you on uh, the webcast today who've taken an hour out of your daily schedule, your busy schedule, to listen to me talk. Uh, like Jen said, I'm going to be talking about four customer engagement trends. Um, that will impact your business. And they all center around customer experience, customer service, and why you should pay attention to these trends. And the, uh, the, the reason that you need to pay attention to these trends, because it will help your business control costs, and it will also affect your top-line revenue. So these customer engagement trends have real quantifiable business benefits. So to set the stage to present these customer engagement trends, what I want to initially do is take a brief walk through history and talk about the cycle um, of technology that we've seen for the last 100 years and focus on where we are today. So technology um, evolves through these cycles uh, that span anywhere from 30 to 40 years. Um, and then a new technology comes along and disrupts the age that we were currently in. If you think back to the um, beginning of the last century, we were in the age of manufacturing that was followed by the age of distribution, and most recently, the age of information. And the age of information in the 1990s was characterized by connected PCs and really efficient supply chains. And companies who controlled the flow of information uh, dominated. So what happened about a decade ago was social media came on the scene. And social media helped usher in what Forrester is calling the age of the customer. And what this means is that today customers, like all of you on the webcast, you control the conversation that you are having with companies. And what this means is that companies have to become a lot more obsessed with delivering engagement experiences in line with your expectations to be able to garner your satisfaction with the engagement experience and your long-term loyalty. So it's no surprise that when we Whole um, company decision makers, we find that customer experience is becoming a top driver for many companies. 92% view customer experience as one of their top priorities. And almost two-thirds of companies, 60% of companies, say they want to use customer experience as a way to differentiate their products and services from the sea of commoditized products available to consumers. It's also no surprise that when we asked over 2,000 um, business and technology um, executives last year what their top investments were for this year, investments in customer-facing departments like sales and customer service top the list. And this is because customer obsession is on every uh, com a, a company executive's mind. But then what you want to do is with all the focus on customer experience and companies wanting to use customer experience as a strategic differentiator and spending for customer-facing technologies, you've got to ask yourself, how well do companies do at delivering 
experiences in line with customer expectations. So for the last seven years, Forrester has been measuring the customer experience that close to 200 brands that we bucket into 40 verticals deliver by asking three basic questions from consumers or customers who have interacted with these brands over the last 90 days. We ask, the three questions that we ask are, are really simple. First of all, how useful was the interaction? Did the interaction end up meeting your needs? Did you get your question answered? Did you get your issue resolved? Um, how easy was the company to do business with? Um, was the interaction or the transaction frictionless, or was it very painful? And lastly, we asked, how enjoyable was the company to do business with? And year over year, we find that more than half the companies end up missing the mark on providing positive experiences. This is the breakdown from the brands that we surveyed this year, where less than half the brands do not provide positive experiences. So again, with all this focus on customer experience being used as a strategic differentiator with all the spending on customer-facing technologies, companies are still unable to deliver experiences in line with your expectations to keep you satisfied and to keep you loyal. Now, the next question, the natural question that comes up is, why do you care about customer loyalty? And it's because good customer experiences correlate to customer loyalty, and a loyal customer will is one who will spend a larger wallet share during their engagement lifetime with that company. A loyal customer will stay true to that brand, will be less likely to churn, to take their business away from that brand. A loyal customer is one who is more likely to consider the company for an additional purchase, another product, a cross-sell, or an upsell. A loyal customer is also one who will act as a company advocate, recommending the, uh, the company, the products and services of that company to their professional network and to their network of uh, family and, and, and friends. So net-net, we care about providing good customer experiences because Good customer experiences correlate to customer loyalty, and a loyal customer will spend more with that particular company during their engagement lifetime. So net-net, like the title of the slide says, good customer experiences are good for business. So why is it so difficult to provide customer experiences that are in line with customer demand. It's because uh, customer-facing departments, whether it's uh, e an e-business department, a customer service department, even a sales department, with every interaction that they have with the customer, they have to walk this real pragmatic balancing act between customer needs on one end and the needs of the business on the other side. They need to provide engagement experiences that keep their customers satisfied and loyal to their brand. But they have to do so in a way that meets the cost structure of the company, that meets the regulatory compliance requirements of the company, which are especially important in heavily regulated industries like healthcare, financial services, telecommunications, where if you're not able to meet these compliance requirements, you end, the company ends up incurring penalties. And then you also want to meet the revenue goals of that uh, particular customer-facing department. And 
this pragmatic balancing act, again, between customer needs on one end and, and, and the needs of a business on the other side, is a balancing act that is very difficult to achieve. And there's some fundamental roadblocks within companies that make this balancing act very difficult to achieve. The first issue is that most companies are a mess of siloed applications. Um, and you think about, for example, communication channels that are used to interact with customers, whether it's a voice channel, whether it's email, chat, your website, your mobile uh, application, most of these communication channels are implemented in a silo. And what our data shows is that 38% of companies are not able to provide consistent cross-channel experiences, meaning the same type of experience, say, over the phone, compared to over the web, compared to chat or email. 44% of companies are unable to provide a seamless handoff between channels for customers. Say that you're, for example, on a website and you have a question about a product before you purchase the product and you want to be able to, uh, to, 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 uh, to chat with an agent who can answer your question. More often than not, you have to restart the conversation with the chat agent because the chat agent does not understand what you have done on the website. So this is what we mean by uh, just under half the companies, 44% of companies aren't able to provide the seamless handoff between communication channels. The other problem that we see is that uh, customers that interact with a brand, you have a single vision of that company. As you discover the products and services that that company has, as you go ahead and buy a product from that company, as you learn how to use the product, as you uh, interact with our customer service organization. So this, uh, uh, this extends the, the concept of most companies are met with siloed applications. You think about, so a customer expects these consistent engagement experiences as they interact with a company. But under the hood, if you look at a traditional company, you've got organizational silos. You, broadly speaking, you've got your marketing uh, organization that's disconnected from your sales organization, that's disconnected from your customer service organization. And each of these organizations use different tools and technologies that aren't um, consistent across all departments. They have, uh, they follow different processes, and they also don't access the same data. So what this means is because you've got these organizational silos, the customer interacting with this company over marketing activities, sales activities, customer service activities, feel like it's a fractured experience with a record of all their interactions and transactions that they've had with the company isn't propagated internally to all customer-facing personnel. Then there's the problem of content and knowledge. Many companies have not empowered their, uh, their customer-facing personnel with accurate, reproducible, reliable content to be able to answer customers' questions. And what we find in most organizations and most companies, content that customer-facing personnel use ends up being located everywhere in a company. And this is what this heat map that is on the screen is showing. Uh, it's showing that for this particular customer that, 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 that we um, did work with, we found that the content assets that their customer-facing personnel used were in email, were in multimedia assets, 
scoring team updates, competitor battle cards. Basically, this content was all over the place. And this content wasn't consistently available to frontline personnel servicing, com- uh, servicing the customers in a way that they could easily act on it. And what we find, it's just taking a step back, is very few companies have invested in knowledge management solutions to be able to add order and easy access to their content. And to be able to empower their customer service agents, even their sales agents, with reproducible, reliable answers to to customer questions. And fewer companies have put in place knowledge programs to make sure that the content evolves in line with customer expectations, meaning new content ends up being added if customers um, start asking new questions, and content uh, on older products that is no longer important or, or, or useful ends up being archived and retired from your knowledge base. Then the other problem that we see is it, 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 it's the problem about the metrics and the way that you measure the success of customer interactions. And many companies and specifically customer service organizations, don't use the right metrics to drive the right behavior in their customer-facing personnel. And this is, again, especially true for customer service agents. And many, and let's focus the conversation um, on customer service organizations. Many of these organizations measure or use measures like handle time, average speed of answer, number of calls handled per hour to to be able to measure uh, the interaction throughput. So what you're doing is by using these measures, you're you're, uh, looking at the productivity and efficiency of your organization, but these metrics aren't measuring the effectiveness of the interactions, Um, meaning were you able to get the customer's problem Resolved, and if you focus on these efficiency and productivity measures only, these metrics can drive agents uh, to, to to pursue the wrong behavior. For example, to escalate or to transfer calls that they could have resolved themselves with a little more time, or it drives behaviors like trying to get the customer off the phone as quickly as possible. And if companies ended up using metrics like first contact resolution, um, customer satisfaction, customer effort, these are better metrics to to use uh, because they're measuring the volume of interactions as well as the success of interactions. So um, very tactically, why is it important to provide engagement experiences in line with customer expectations. From, and, and there's two main reasons why it's important. First of all, poor engagement is costly. What happens when a customer, for example, goes on your website and can't find the answer to, to their question? Um, they'll end up recontacting you. Uh, if the question is about a customer service inquiry, they'll recontact you three quarters of the time. Uh, If it's a purchasing question, they'll contact you 61% of the time. And when customers recontact you, they're recontacting you over a more expensive channel, a chat channel, email channel, a phone call, for example. And these recontact rates or the, 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 the cost of these recontacts are very expensive, um, depending on the volume of the recontacts, and they can uh, they can end up running you uh, millions and millions of dollars, again, depending on the, the volume of recontacts and the channel that is used to recontact, uh, to contact you again. The other problem is, is that customers complain about poor engagement experiences. They complain about poor service. They will blog about it, tweet about it, put a Facebook post on it, uh, about it. They will rate you negatively. And what happens 
is that in the world of social media that we live in, these negative ratings and reviews end up getting um, amplified and can end up eroding your brand. Data from Forrester says that 41% say that complaints about customer service from other consumers on social sites influence their image of a company. More often than not, when, uh, for example, when I need to buy a product and I go to Amazon and I see a, a, a list of commoditized products, the first thing I do is I read the ratings and the reviews. And if a product is rated negatively, it will affect my decision to purchase that product. And so negative ratings and reviews also influence future purchases. And not only can erode your brand, but can also erode revenue. So what can you do? What are the engagement trends that you should pay attention to to move the needle on your customer service or your customer engagement to deliver it more in line with customer expectations, to garner their satisfaction and loyalty, and ultimately, that's important because it translates to increased revenue and lower cost. And the way that I think about how you should do this is in a framework of what I call the four Ps. So customer service or customer engagement should be pain-free, should be effortless, should be proactive, should be personalized, and as well be productive. Because again, being able to deliver good customer service or customer engagement is a pragmatic balancing act between keeping your customers satisfied and, and delivering it at a cost that makes sense to the business. So that is a reason why it's very important to focus on productivity measures as well. So for the rest of the presentation, what I want to do is explore what these four Ps mean. So firstly, you need to understand that your customers do not expect to be overly delighted, to be wowed by your service, to have these Disney-esque experiences. Customers are very busy. They have an issue. They have a question. They want to contact you. They want to get their answer as quickly as possible so they can get on with their busy lives. And that's what our data at Forrester shows. 52% will abandon their online purchase if they can't find a quick answer. 71%, that's almost three-quarters of the consumers say that valuing their time is the most important thing a company can do to provide them with good service. Know that customers want to be able to interact with you online. 63% prefer online customer service instead of talking to an agent over the phone. Again, because it's efficient, it's effortless, it's pain-free. But what we find is if we look at the satisfaction rating of the online channels, like FAQs, like online forums, uh, virtual agents, we find that the satisfaction ratings for the online channels are, are, are lower compared to the channels that, um, that allow a customer to connect to a live agent, for example, the phone channel or uh, a chat channel. And this goes back to the point where customers want to be able to interact with companies online because it's frictionless, it's effortless, it's pain-free. Yet many companies haven't paid attention to their content strategy, their knowledge strategy, so they're not pushing out the right content to their customers in a format that easily is, is able to be found and easily answers the customer's questions. Okay, so we know that customers want to prefer to use the online channel. But what are they actually doing? Uh, when we look uh, at over uh, 7,000 data points, we look at trend data of the channels that customers actually use to connect to customer service organizations. Mm -hmm. And what you're seeing on the screen here is some trend data that goes back three years. 
Uh, we find that customers, because the phone channel is still delivering better engagement experiences than other channels, the phone channel is still being widely used. But it's quickly backed by the online channels, the, the, the digital channels, the social channels. So what's, there's three takeaways in the sea of data that I've got um, on, this, uh, on the screen. First of all, customers want to be using a range of communication channels. Second takeaway is that the, the channel mix changes year over year. You look at trend data three years back, and you see that the online self-service channel has jumped from 57 to 67%. Chat, chat has gone up from 30 to 43%. Twitter, 11 to 22%. So the channel mix that customers are using is changing year over year. And the third takeaway is, is that there's new communication channels that are emerging that customers want to use. And so our engagement world is getting more complex over time instead of less complex. For example, screen sharing, virtual agents, click to call are channels that were well used the last time we took the, this data that were not on our radar three years ago. Okay? So channels is one part of the equation. The other part, which I've already talked about in this presentation, is that customers want to start a conversation on one channel and continue it on another channel without having to repeat themselves or restart the conversation. And uh, to be able to deliver this type of pain-free service, you need to understand that your customers want to interact with you over a range of channels. And again, be able to move conversations seamlessly from one channel to another channel. You also have to realize that the world is moving to mobile devices, and you and you have to you have to to rethink the way that you engage with your customers with a mobile first mindset in place. Customers are using laptops, desktops, smartphones, tablets. Our data shows that customers have, on average, three connected devices. And even the golden generation, those that are 70 years older and older, have an average of over two connected devices. And they expect the same engagement experiences across these different devices. What's also important to know is that the time that customers are spending on their mobile devices is overtaking time spent on other devices. If you look at, this is data from Comscore that showed that in January of this year, um, and, and it's the blue curve on the screen, time spent on mobile devices had overtaken time spent on other devices. So the engagement experiences are moving off your PCs and off your laptops onto your, your, your smartphones and your tablets. And you have to you have to ensure that you're supporting your customers in a pain-free way on these devices because these are the ones that they want to be using. So moving on to my second P, it's all about proactive uh, engagement. So you want to be able to proactively communicate with your customers. You want to send them alerts and notifications about products and services that they've bought. Think about flight changes or bank balances, um, emergency warnings. Um, and think about your, your electronic devices or your software. Um, you want your, the company to tell you about potential issues or fixes for their products or service alerts or fix tax. And you want companies to communicate this information to you over the, the, the voice channel, uh, surely, but also over the digital channels, email, uh, SMS, and even over the social channels, uh, like VMware, for example, um, uses Twitter to send out new content and patches and service alerts um, by Twitter. They, they have a, a, a separate Twitter handle for each of their products. And they, they, they proactively communicate to their customer base in, uh, over Twitter because that's one of the ways that their customers want to be interacting with a VMware. So, 
So why do you want to do this? Why do you want to proactively uh, communicate to your customers? And it's back to that pragmatic balance between meeting um, customer needs and at a cost that makes sense to the business. So proactive communication is important because from a customer's ex uh, uh, perspective, um, you will feel like uh, the company is looking out for your best interests. But from uh, the, the, the internal company perspective, proactive outbound communications help educate your customers. And it prevents them from contacting you, uh, which ultimately ends up containing costs. So what are ways of proactively communicating? Um, at, at, it's, uh, at one of the more basic forms, it's proactive chat, and customers are amenable to, uh, to, to having a proactive chat invitation pop up. 70% uh, say that they like having an instant uh, message uh, or, or a proactive chat box appear and ask them if they need help with their online research or purchase. But proactive communication can extend into something that the Delta app does. Um, what it does is it warns you of a canceled flight. This was a flight from Atlanta to, to Cleveland to, to L.A. And the Cleveland to L.A. leg ended up getting canceled. So you get a proactive notification um, through the app that that flight's been canceled, which is good information, but it leaves me hanging in Cleveland. But what the Delta app does is it goes a step further and it presents to me a set of different flights as, that I can choose from. And with a, uh, uh, just a single tap um, on the flight that, 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 that suits me the best, I can rebook my flight and be able to get home. So it's proactive engagement, again, of being able to communicate status to the customer but allowing the customer to take action on this proactive communication to get the job done, to be able to realize a business outcome. There's also proactive communication in terms of being able to push out via rules, via decisioning, a coupon or an offer at the right point in the engagement um, uh, journey of a customer. For example, if you go on um, L.L. Bean or Land's End, uh, depending on your shopping um, pattern on the site, you will be proactively, no, uh, uh, pro, you, you'll end up having a, a, a proactive offer or coupon presented to you. In this case, it's a free $10 gift card uh, to use um, um, on the site. It's also, if you think about proactive, uh, proactive engagement, it goes a, a step further to, to, to deeply personalize the type of engagement. Um, for example, um, there's a service uh, that, uh, called Google Now that Google, um, uh, that Google offers. And what it does is it reads through your calendar, your email. Uh, it takes information about the weather. Uh, it takes information about where you need to be that day, traffic patterns. And it's learning from it, your commute patterns. And it, as you get into the car to go to work in the morning, for example, it proactively pushes out the traffic, weather information, and the best commute route for you. So think about proactive communication, just not as proactive chat or a proactive offer, but real deep, personalized, proactive engagement. And think about this engagement not only between the customer and the company, but it can also extend into what we're calling the Internet of Things. Um, for example, proactive engagement from, from, from um, the fitness devices, like Fitbits um, that you wear, uh, that, per, that, that, that monitor your exercise habits and proactively alert you 
like you haven't taken, for example, you haven't done enough exercise during the day. Or a, a, a more a, an interesting example is being able to proactively have devices that proactively communicate their status to their customers. And a great example is from New England Biolabs. Um, they're, they're a supplier of DNA reagents that's used for DNA research. And New England Biolabs wanted more visibility into the products that the scientists um, were using. They also wanted to be able to better manage their inventory. And what they ended up doing is um, they, 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 put, uh, they, they put these freezers connected to the Internet in the scientist's labs with a um, tablet in front of these freezers. And the um, scientists would check in, um, would open the freezer by entering the code and then check in and, and check out um, chemicals, reagents from the freezer. And what, this, uh, what was happening is this information was being communicated back to New England Biolabs. And New England Biolabs would use this information to proactively ship out products to the scientists and understand what products were being used together and would use this information to be able to bundle products together that, that were better tailored to the scientists' unique use. So this type of proactive engagement is not only between a company and a customer, but it can extend into the world of connected devices, the entire connected ecosystem that we live in. And just to bring it back down to basics, what's also important um, is any type of proactive communications as you communicate over different channels and different touch points, make sure that you're delivering consistent messages across these different channels. And again, this gets back down to being able to have a solid foundation of content and knowledge within your company. The third P that I want to talk about is personalized um, uh, um, customer engagement. And you want to be able to use rules um, or predictive analytics to be able to personalize deeply personalized conversations that you are having with your customers, to help understand customers, their behaviors, be able to proactively and in a personalized way um, recommend the right upsell, the right cross-sell for a particular customer, get the work to the right person in the organization, and be able to guide the service experience again, to, to, to make sure that the engagement is as personalized as possible. To be able to personalize interactions, you also want to be listening to your customers uh, via direct surveys or via social listening and be able to understand what customers are saying, uh, separate the noise from the actionable insight and route the insights to the right place in the organization where it can get acted on to be able to, to, to uh, more deeply personalize engagement experiences. And you also want to make sure that your customer service or customer engagement is as productive as possible. Because again, the, you, you, uh, being able to engage with your customers is a pragmatic balance between meeting the needs of your customers and being able to meet the cost structures of your business. And when we surveyed, this is actually data from Dimension Data, uh, we surveyed customer, over 800 customer service organizations. Their, one of their main preoccupations were being able to increase efficiency and reducing costs. And there's many ways that you can make, uh, that you can strike, that, that you can help uh, make organizations more productive. Just to highlight a couple ways, is first of all, focus on the agent experience and make sure that the agents are not struggling with the tool set and processes that they need to follow. Uh, make their life as easy as possible because in the survey that we did, 
we found that in 99% of cases, being able to provide a better agent experience translated into better customer service outcomes. So the agent, instead of struggling with their tool set, is able to listen to the conversation that they are having um, on the phone or over chat with their customers and be able to deliver better quality of service. The other thing you want to do is, again, empower your agents with the right information to service their customers, a record of all transactions, all interactions over the different communication channels, a very easily being able to understand the tier of service of that particular customer, the products and services that they've bought, and be able to push in a proactive and as well in a contextual way the right knowledge to the agent at the right point in the engagement cycle so that the agent can act on it. Again, making the agent's job easier as well as empowering the agent with all the right information at the right point in the engagement process so that the agent can build on the relationship that has already been established with the customer instead of having to rediscover information that's already been communicated to them. Uh, if you look at it from a technology perspective, it's important to, to deeply investigate cloud uh, technologies. We find that over 70% of companies for example, for customer service, are um, expanding, using, or planning to adopt within the next two years cloud-based solutions. And cloud solutions uh, push the onus of the software maintenance and upkeep on the vendor. And it allows companies to be more agile, to be able to push out innovation faster to their customers so that the company is able to more quickly react to changing um, business pressures. It gives cloud technology just gives the business greater agility and flexibility to 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 uh, to change and react uh, to, to different competing business pressures. And then at the last, uh, my last point is um, again. We've talked about technology. We've talked about process. It's also important to use measures that uh, incite the right behavior in your customer-facing personnel. And you should choose a balanced scorecard of metrics that cover satisfaction and cost measures, as well as compliance if it's important to your business and revenue. And then this balanced scorecard of metrics you want to establish at the high um, level, KPI level, and then you want to make sure that the operational metrics that you're actually measuring on a day-to-day -day basis, on an hourly basis, end up correlating to these high level KPIs that map to your business goals. And this will help drive the right agent behavior, again, in line with your company strategy of delivering differentiated experiences to your customer. So before we open it up uh, for questions, just um, in parting, I want to say uh, that at a high level, you care about providing great engagement experiences uh, because it will keep your customers satisfied and loyal, and that ultimately translates into a revenue uplift. More than that, poor engagement experiences are costly and they can erode your brand. So how do you do this? First of all, think about your customer experience or your engagement strategy. Um, what is your engagement strategy? And then if you think about, for example, your customer service organization, make sure that your customer service organization is being run in a way that supports your overall company strategy. Deeply understand your customers who they are, the channels they want to use, the devices they want to use, what they're saying about you, to be able to tailor the, the service delivery to their specific channels and touch points and their specific needs. Make sure that you use technology that will allow you to deliver pain-free, proactive, personalized, and productive service. And make sure that you use technology that doesn't lock you in to today's world, but that can future-proof you as your needs change. 
And lastly, don't forget about culture. And don't forget about uh, inciting, incentivizing and rewarding your customer-facing personnel in line with your company's value proposition and make sure that your, 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 your culture is as customer-centric as possible and that, again, uh, customer-centric actions are communicated and are uh, incentivized and rewarded. And with that, uh, Jen, I think I'm going to hand it back to you and, and open it up for questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Kate. So now I'd like to spend some time just answering questions, and we, we'd like to thank everyone who's already submitted those. The Q&A will stay open until the top of the hour, so feel free to continue submitting any new or follow-on questions as we go. All right, so Kate, the first question. Are there differences in customer engagement between B2B customers and B2C customers? Um, yeah, and it, and it goes even further than that. Um, uh, first of all, for all engagement experiences, you do want this personalized, proactive, productive, pain-free type of engagement. Um, think about two businesses, um, and they're, they're B2C uh, businesses. Say, say, say you're a financial services um, company that, that caters to high net worth individuals. And think about uh, if you are a, um, a retailer that caters to a youth audience. Uh, for the retailer, the social channels, the mobile touch points are going to become uh, increasingly important. For the financial services institution that caters to high net worth um, personnel or a high net worth clients, um, a, a very personalized one-on-one -on -one conversation over the phone is, is going to be more important. So there are differences between B2B and B2C. There's also differences depending on the type of business and the type of customer um, that, you, uh, that, that you are targeting. Does that answer your question? I think so. Um, the next one is uh, kind of a follow-on to that, but do you have any data on the frequency of channel usage by gender, age, industry, geography, et cetera? Um, for example, does one use live chat more than phone? Um, we do. Um, Forrester does have some of that data. We have it by country. We have it by uh, demographic. We have device usage by country, by demographic. I don't know about gender. Um, there's a lot of information up on our site that you can look for. And if the, uh, the ask of that question has specific information or data points that they are looking for, you can try to email me, and I will see what I can find for you. OK, yeah, so and kind of that they are different. Go ahead. No, not, not that there, there are definitely differences. Okay, and is there, in addition to the data you have available on Forrester.com, are there any particular um, readings you can recommend or, or studies? For channel differences and chat, um, a chat rates, yes. I know um, both yeah, just for, for, um, you, got, you, you have a tremendous amount of information on your website in your resources section. Um, that talks about the chat effectiveness, um, and you have a lot of benchmarks as well. And Forrester has quite a bit of data on their site. Um, so there is the, that, that data available. Um, again, if you're specifically looking for some data points, um, the, uh, the person who asked that question should email me um, at my Forrester email and see if I can find uh, this information for you. Okay, great, thanks. The next question is, how many people actually respond to proactive chat as opposed to just welcoming it? Um, I don't have that data in front of me. Um, we do have uh, data on, um, I, I don't, I, I'd have to get back to you. I don't have that data in front of me. Uh, I know it is a number um, 
I, I, I'm sorry. I don't have that data in front of me. That's okay. We can uh, that, provide your contact information for follow-up. If Ross Haskell or if one of your technical folks had logged me in around the phone, that's a better question for you. Okay. All right. And then the next question is um, how important do you think it is that all companies have every communication channel available? Uh, I think it's absolutely not important for every company to have every communication channel available. Again, think back to a my, my two examples of a um, financial services company that caters to high net worth individuals. Uh, Twitter, Facebook would probably be meaningless for that company. Um, think about a retail brand that caters to the youth audience. Um, probably email would be of less importance or very little importance to that, 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 that demographic. So what's important is you don't want to offer a smorgasbord of communication channels. You want to understand, first of all, how your customers want to be communicating with you. But it's, uh, so it's important to know the device as well as the channel um, and then be able to offer a subset of all available communication channels um, to that customer, but choose the ones that they want to be using. All right. And then I think um, this one might be a hefty answer, so it might have to be our last one, but how do you think customer engagement will change in the next year or even the next five years? I think it's going to become a lot more important um, as devices proliferate. Um, I, you look around my house and I've got iPads and smartphones and, uh, ta and other tablets and PCs and laptops um, as well as gaming devices and TVs. And as a consumer, I expect, um, first of all, consistent engagement experiences across these different devices. I expect to be able, depending on where I am, if I'm sitting at my desk, if I'm in the car driving my kids, if I'm, um, if I'm somewhere else uh, in my in my daily life, I will choose whatever channel and whatever device is most um, simple or useful to me at that particular moment in time. So how is it going to change? I think companies are going to be under increased pressure to provide these consistent engagement experiences across devices and touch points. Uh, companies are also going to um, I have to focus on providing the effortless engagement, as pain-free as possible. And again, going back to my four Ps, um, as personalized, as productive. And most companies, um, looking at the data that we have, provide suboptimal experiences. So there's going to be a tremendous pressure to, for companies to be able to provide these uh, contextual, proactive, pain-free experiences to customers uh, that, 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 again, are consistent across devices. Uh, because if companies don't, uh, customers are going to be frustrated with the level of service that they are getting and will end up um, leaving that brand. All right. And then one more question. Um, what do you think about migrating emails to chat as a channel with shorter SLA? Do you feel like it's a good direction from your point of view? It uh, depends on the type of inquiries that you're getting over chat, uh, I mean over email. Um, companies have done it. There's a whole set of companies that have decommissioned their email channel very successfully. Um, chat is more expensive than email, typically. Um, chat email can also be a good channel if there is some offline research that is needed before an answer is uh, given to the customer. 
So before you whole, uh, you, you end up uh, decommissioning the email channel, what I would do is understand the types of interactions coming over email and see if those interactions can be handled, first of all, with better web self-service, and then secondly, with chat. And if there's a set, if there's a large number of email inquiries that are coming in that can't be handled by chat or web self-service, you may think about keeping the email channel. But if you believe, after looking at the type of um, email inquiries that you're getting, uh, that, that these inquiries could effectively be moved to, to chat um, or better web self and better web self service, because it, it, it's yeah, you have to focus on both. Uh, then absolutely, I would um, say go ahead and decommission the email channel. Make sure that you notify your customer base about what's happening. Um, and there are many companies, uh, telecom companies, um, consumer electronics companies that have successfully decommissioned their email channel. Okay, great. Uh, that brings us to the top of the hour. So apologies if we didn't get to your question, but if that's the case, uh, we'll follow up via email. We want to thank everyone for joining today. If you have any additional questions, you can reach out to Kate directly at kleggett at forrester.com, or you can follow her on Twitter at Kate Leggett. One last quick note, today's webinar was recorded, so we'll provide a link to each of you to review or share with your colleagues within the next day or so. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.